And welcome back to Divorcing Your Mortgage. I'm your host, Matthias Gertz, and it's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce you to Sama Abukadir, otherwise known as Sam. She is a d attorney based in Florida. And, you know, I was reading her bio, but I love what she says about what she does more about more than about her history and her college and all of that. Let me read to you what she says that she does. We help families going through the toughest times of their lives, divorce, paternity, domestic violence, adoption, collaborative, parental responsibility, and time sharing, custody, child support, alimony, spousal support, child relocation, equitable distribution, post-judgment and modification, prenups and postnups. That's what she does. Sam, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm really, really happy to have you. So um, it, it sounds from you, that description that you are deeply, deeply involved in all aspects of family law. Is that correct? That is correct. And I don't know if that's fortunate or unfortunate. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I, I that's really interesting you should say that. It brings me to the, the, the question I was going to ask is, can, can you share with us what is it that attracted you to to being being involved in all of these high conflict issues um, at the most stressful time in many people's lives. So my husband and I during law school um, clerked for an administrative probate judge. So we did not start off in family law. However, mm. as you can tell, they go hand in hand. So when we got into probate court, we very quickly realized that there were a lot of family law issues, and so. When I started the firm a little over five years ago, I thought instead of putting my eggs all in one basket, which is probate, let's do two areas of law. So we did probate and family law. And ever since we've done that, we've attracted different people from the community because we're mm -hmm. from two different backgrounds. And so it's just meshed really well. And are you practicing with your husband? You guys are both in the firm? He has his own firm where... Uh -huh. We are transferring his firm over to mine and we are joining forces. And is it still going to be probate and, and family law at the same yeah, time? So the, the name of our firm is the Florida Probate and Family Law Firm. Mm -hmm. uh, we have eight offices across the state of Florida. We're hoping to open three more this year. It's interesting that, that you're straddling this uh, edge between probate and family law. Any attorneys spend their entire lives in, in one section and you guys have taken on two sections, each of which could be a full-time um, occupation. What what advantage does it give you as a counselor being well-versed in both probate and family law? So what we're starting to see is that when somebody goes through a divorce, for example, mm -hmm. um, and they have assets, they're, they're confused as to what the next steps are. If they have their estate planning in order, once they get divorced, they're like, well, Sam, what do I do now with my estate planning? I left everything to my husband or I left everything to my husband and my kids. Do I need to redo everything? So we thought this through before we started the firm. And we thought mm -hmm. that because there were going to be these types of issues, it would be smart to do both areas and become well-versed in both areas so that people can come to us for any issues in these, in both of these practice areas. Another, um, big one that we see another big issue that we see is once um time sharing is determined in family court parents are always asking us well what if something happens to my ex-spouse who's going to take care of the kid how do we decide these matters and that is in probate court and estate mm -hmm. planning so it just made sense to us to be honest okay i i, I understand um so you're doing probate and estate planning so we estate planning actually falls under probate. So within the mm -hmm. probate realm, you see estate administration, estate litigation, guardianship administration and litigation, and estate planning. All right. Do most of your divorces fall under litigation or are you involved in collaborative remediation as well? So the head of our family law department, Brenda Shapiro, was one of the founding members of the collaborative uh, family law institute in the state of Florida and South Florida, to be specific. 
Uh, so we have one of the experts is what I'd like to say in our firm. Okay. And so I would say that unfortunately, probably 90% of our divorces are contested um, mm. and the rest are uncontested or fall into the collaborative uh, realm of divorces. Okay. Those are interesting statistics. Uh, can you give me, um, I mean, any insight into why it is that um, so many people still opt for litigation in this day and age? So that's a great question. And it's something that we think about often because it's honestly what keeps the firm running because if we were only doing uncontested, it would be much simpler, much quicker. Mm -hmm. um, and it'd be less of a headache, less you know, mental health issues, all of that, it all goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the reason... I don't think people opt for litigation. I think it ends up that way because people can't see eye to eye. And the key mm -hmm. to not seeing eye to eye is communication. So what we mm -hmm. see in both parties is they're not willing to communicate to come to a reasonable resolution because all they want to do is win. And you pointed this out earlier on. Yes. People are hard headed. They want their way. They want to be heard and they don't care what the other party says. And mm -hmm. the unfortunate part of this is if there are kids involved, that is not the right way to go about a divorce. No, it, it's uh, it, it's definitely a problem if a divorce it isn't child centric um, in, in the way it's being designed. I did notice in your bio uh, that you speak Arabic. You do. Are you doing a lot of work in the in the Arabic community in uh, in Florida? So I touched on this earlier. So my background is Palestinian American. Mm -hmm. And my husband is Puerto Rican, Cuban, with a little bit of Lebanese sprinkled in there. You've got, you, you've, got, you've got all the bases covered. <laughs> so we have a very uh, diverse background. And to make us even more different, our associates and our um, team members all come from very diverse backgrounds. So okay. when we created this firm, what was important to us is if people from different backgrounds, cultures, religions, whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, come to us, we didn't want them to feel judged. We wanted them to feel understood. So the answer to your question is yes, we are one of the only Arab American family law attorneys in the state of Florida. So we get a lot of the Arab American community. As clients. But the reason that I asked that question um, is because certain cultures have a tendency to be, for lack of a better term, more machismo yeah. than than others. And um, and since and since you were working in uh, significantly in the Arab community uh, or the the uh, Arabic community, I was just wondering if you felt that that might be one of the reasons why so many of your cases uh, go to litigation. No. So I don't think that it's a cultural issue. I think okay. that it's just the trend of divorces in general. I would say we have more Hispanic clients than we do Arab clients. Okay. And so I just think that it's honestly, it's just the day and age right now. I just think mm. that people are, are more prone to litigating their cases because they want what they want and they're not willing mm. to see things clearly. I also think, and this is controversial to say, I think there are a lot of attorneys dabbling in areas that they shouldn't be dabbling in, and it ends up hurting their clients and their cases. So instead of an attorney guiding their client into maybe a non-litigation route, you see attorneys that are leading their clients in the wrong direction, and that's also causing litigation. I see. Okay. Why do you feel that attorneys are doing that? You want me to be Absolutely. very direct and blunt? Ab absolutely. Uh, money. I think that attorneys know that they bill by the hour and that mm -hmm. if they keep the case going on longer, maybe they don't have a huge caseload or maybe they don't. I don't know. I, I think that morally it's incorrect. I think it goes against our ethics code. Mm -hmm. And if you can work out something or if you can lead your client into thinking a different way and showing them that there are different solutions, it's our right. obligation. And I just don't think attorneys maybe are thinking that way. See, and, and that's interesting because um, in California, there's uh, uh, CPCAL, which is Collaborative Practice California, which I happen to be a member of because I'm a certified divorce lending professional. And the trend out here is, is a little bit different. While there still is a fair amount of litigation, many clients are opting either for mediation or for uh, collaborative divorce. One of the big uh, obstacles in, in collaborative divorce, however, is the price. 
And we're also seeing a trend where a lot of people are opting to do divorces themselves, okay? Because they feel they can, they can save money uh, in, in that regard. What's your thought about that? I mean, is, is that if, if two people can sort of mediate their own divorce, are there advantages to having them uh, uh, save some money and do it themselves? So the way that I like to think or explain this to my clients are, if you need a surgery, are you going to do the surgery yourself? Or are you going to go to an expert? Are you going to go to a doctor to get it done? And it's the same way with your case. Why are you going to risk getting um, an order on something that could be permanent um, without consulting with an expert, without talking to someone? Does it work that you both mediate without attorneys? Yes, it does sometimes work. Is it to your advantage? I don't think so. I think you need to go and speak to an attorney. Um, I think that you need to speak to multiple attorneys until you find somebody that you're comfortable with. And then I think that they guide you in the right direction and get you the type of order, the type of settlement, the type of mediation settlement agreement that you're mm -hmm. looking for. But I don't think you do it blindly. Well, let, let's just talk about that for a sec. Let's just go down that road. You know, um, one aspect of divorce that's become more and more popular in the last decade or so is the idea of divorce coaches. Um, and, and many people are employing them to get some of that basic information that we're talking about without having to pay the per hourly of an attorney. Do you feel that divorce coaches are, are a positive uh, in, in divorce situations? I think they're a positive when they're working with your attorney. Okay. I don't think that they're a solution on their own. I think you definitely can consult with them, but I still think you need an attorney. So uh, so your take is that regardless of which direction somebody goes, in other words, themselves or or litigation or mediation or collaboration, um, that you feel that an attorney should be involved uh, and should be engaged early on in the process. Absolutely. I think that this is a decision for life. And I don't think that clients usually realize that modifications are not easy to get. So once mm -hmm. you get an order in place to change that order, is extremely difficult. So why even risk or dabble with something like that? Just get somebody who is well-versed in this area to help you understand, you know, everything that's going on in your case before you make a decision. Gotcha. Um, well, you know, one thing that many people are concerned about is that in the last two and a half years, the, the cost of living has gone up about 20%. And this, this has a tendency to um, take divorce agreements, especially child things like child support, and completely you know, throw it up in the air and take that apart. Uh, a lot of people, just like just like mortgages have fixed rate and adjustable rate, um, is there such a thing in divorce where you can have a adjustable child support? So I want to say yes and no. And the reason I want to say yes and no is once child support is determined, the only way you change that is with a modification. However, sometimes what ends up happening in a settlement agreement is let's say you're getting divorced and the baby is six months old and breastfeeding, right? Mm -hmm. You can come up with an agreement where the baby is with the mom, let's say 70% of the time because of breastfeeding and you mm -hmm. all have agreed to this. So child support is gonna be more because mom has the child more. But then you have a, what's called a step-up plan. So once the child reaches two or three or four or five years old, you're agreeing to this ahead of time. Then oh the God. child support is going to change with time because you're going to have more time with that kid. Is something like that um, unique or special? Or do you tend to gravitate in that direction because of your background in probate and estate? So I don't think it's the norm. I'm going to be honest with you. I think uh -huh. that it's hard for dads to understand that sometimes... Um, it might be more beneficial for the mom to have more time with the child as the child is younger. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that courts are are uh, moving away from that theory as well or from that idea. So I do think that it's not the norm. I think it's the minority. So what we're starting to see is that there aren't very many changes in the agreement. Whatever they agree to now is basically what's going to happen for the next 18 years. Gotcha. All right. And is it is it common practice at this point to take uh, cost of living uh, into consideration for that 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 two decade period, or um, actually that's a contentious issue that comes up down the road? It's something that comes up down the road because it's what what we would need as in a modification. So uh -huh. we don't 
plan ahead for the cost of living because we don't know what's going to happen right over the next 18 years. Mm -hmm. So it's on the parents or the spouses themselves um, to bring the other party back to court when they realize that the other party is making more money. But the tricky part to this is how do you really know if the other party is making more money other than their lifestyle changes, right? Mm -hmm. So we get calls all the time where a mom will say he's paying $200 in child support, but he's driving a Lamborghini. Can I take him back to court? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we look at different things that are on social media. Social media is our friend. Um, And then we make a determination based on the evidence on whether we can modify and we go from there. I see. Okay. Well, um, hopefully, hopefully he doesn't buy a Lamborghini. He just buys a Mercedes or um, and it, and it isn't it isn't too obvious. We're in Miami. Yes. Well. Okay. I got you. Well, I'm in I'm in L.A. We see them here too. <laughs> I, I I hear you. I'm moving back to to communication for a moment. All right. In in couples, we're, we're talking about couples with uh, children, and you were throwing out examples of 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 having infants. So we're talking about young families. We're seeing nationwide a, a growing trend of what's basically called gray divorce with people over age 55 uh, getting divorces. Uh, Are you seeing that same trend where you are? We are, and it's quite surprising. And it's something that the family bar is constantly talking about because it's not something that we've seen in the past. When you say not in the past, how how recent would you say it's it's been that it's uh, becoming um, uh, obvious, shall we say? I would say within the last five years, we've seen middle-aged people getting divorced, 50 and older, 55 and older. Um, For sure, you know, we've seen larger numbers of this um, demographic getting getting divorced. Okay, hold that thought. We're going to take a quick break uh, and and we're going to stay on this when we get back. You're listening to Divorcing Your Mortgage. I'm your host, Matthew Skirts, and we'll be right back after this. And welcome back to Divorcing Your Mortgage. Um, Sam, so before the break, we were talking about um, gray divorce. And you said that in your practice that you've seen a tremendous uptick in gray divorce in the last five years. Do you attribute it to anything in particular? And um, how is it forcing you to modify your practice? So I I don't know if COVID has anything to do about this, but we've seen ever since COVID has taken effect, we've seen more gray divorces. It's also something that's complicating divorces, to be honest, because when you're thinking about it, these people, or at least our clients, have been married for 25 plus years. Uh, We're doing a lot of divorces where they've been married 30, 40, 50 plus years. Mm -hmm. So it's not something we're used to, which means that there are usually more assets involved. Even if the kids are older and over the age of 18, dividing assets is still very complicated. And we're also having to deal with two people that are set in their ways because they're older. Mm -hmm. And so we're having to navigate those different issues that come along with those types of divorces. Gotcha. You know, one of the interesting things that makes a great divorce unique is that because we're we're dealing with a different generation, we're, we're dealing with certain norms in the baby boomer generation that aren't necessarily norms in millennials and the Z generation. And in particular, I'm talking about the fact that that stereotypically that the man controls all the money and the woman and the woman uh, in the relationship doesn't really have um, not only an understanding of their finances, but even any skill sets in terms of of handling that. Um, How is the fact that your firm uh, also does probate and estate uh, helping in those kind of situations? So I mentioned this earlier, but there are a lot of different cultural issues that we're seeing. So you hit it on the head uh, where we have a lot of uh, men who are professionals and they are divorcing divorcing their wives after 20, 25 plus years of marriage. And the wives have always been stay-at-home moms. 
Um, and so it is extremely difficult for the woman to then have to pick up and figure out what she's going to do with her life because to complicate matters even further, uh, Florida last July uh, eliminated permanent alimony and also allowed fathers to, if it's a paternity action, so they're not married, mm -hmm. um, have the norm of having 50% time sharing with their kids instead of having to fight for having 50% time sharing. So the laws have changed in, I would say... <laughs> in um what's the word i'm looking for to advantage men um and so it's just making things a little bit more difficult for women however to connect it to probate court we're starting to see that when women are getting divorced we're setting them up with financial professionals we're teaching them about mortgages we're mm -hmm. serving more as counselors and therapists um, uh -huh. along the attorney, you know, hat that we hold, mm -hmm. um, and we're teaching them about estate planning and the importance of estate planning. I see. Do Do you think that this is a situation where maybe uh, in the future you'll actually create teams with financial counselors or with divorce coaches or with um, other uh, what I'll what I'll call quasi licensed uh, individuals that can take over some of those things? So what we've been building out or what we'd like to build out at our practice is mm -hmm. it's like a team 100 list or a VIP list. And it's our trusted professionals in different areas so that when our clients are going through a divorce, we're able to tell them, these are the people we trust. These are the people we would use if we were in your situation. And gotcha. we think it's important that you talk to them because if you've never written a check before, this is something you've got to learn before this divorce is finalized. Gotcha. Is that something that you're going to be doing in the future or something that's in process right now? It's in process right now. And to take it a step further, we're also probably going to be doing webinars okay. and bringing on different people to to educate the community on what the next steps are during a divorce and after the divorce. OK, well, that sounds great. That sounds like a very holistic approach. To, to something like this. It's particularly interesting in the state of Florida, which is such a retirement uh, uh, oriented uh, part of the country, especially South Florida, um, talking about um, uh, these great divorces. You, you mentioned a few moments ago, uh, and the way you phrased it was um, men divorcing their wives. And yet, statistically, four out of five divorces are instituted by the women nationwide. Um, are you finding that it's different in, in your backyard? That's a great question. Um, I think that I'm basing it off of our clientele. Mm -hmm. And right now we probably have a 50-50 clientele. So 50% wow. of our clients are men and 50% are women. I will, however, say that the majority of our clients who are men are uh, professionals. So think doctors, accountants, lawyers, engineers, where the 50% of our clients who are women are more so not in the same situation okay, and not the same educational background. So I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> well, well, let, let's put it this way. But, but in terms of which spouse initiated the divorce? I think we're still 50-50 when I'm looking okay. at my clients. All right. Okay. That, that, that's very interesting. It makes one wonder uh, what's going on because those numbers seem to go against, against a lot of the trends. Um, so I'm curious, let's talk about the 50% just for a moment that are instituted by men. Um, and you say they're mostly professionals. And, I, and I'm curious in those situations because um, it would seem to me that it would behoove these men to want to have a mediated or a collaborated divorce instead of uh, a litigated one, because uh, frankly, at that point in their lives, it would be less expensive and and certainly less contentious. And on top of that, they're they're divorcing a woman that they've been together with for 30 years, give or take. Uh, it's always been curious to me that when people get into divorce, they have all of this venom, and yet this venom is directed towards somebody that at one time in their life, they, they swore that they absolutely loved and adored. Do you have any insight into why it is that these men in particular wouldn't want to go uh, a more mediated route? 
So I think that it's money motivated. And even though it makes perfect sense what you're saying, it would probably cost them a lot less if they're going to um, mediate and settle from the get-go. I think what ends up happening is they think that they're going to benefit more if they if they take longer and try to manipulate uh, the situation. And what I, I mean see. by that is that they're basically pushing it to see how long she's going to last and how long she's able to afford the lifestyle that is going on during the divorce, even though there's a status quo order. So uh -huh. I think it's just the strategy that they're taking from their attorneys. And I think it's also in their head and they're scared about losing everything that they've built. And in their mind, what they've built is theirs and it's not a 50, 50 uh, situation, mm. 50, 50 type of situation. So in Florida, you have to go to mediation before you go to trial, but usually the mediation is very, very far along in the case. It's not early on. Uh -huh. What we try to encourage people to do when we talk to them is, why don't you talk to your spouse? Why don't you guys try to come to an agreement? Why don't you think this through? And then maybe we can go to mediation early on, but mm. that's not the norm. You see, it, it's interesting. And, and I'm not being political when I say this, but it, it almost sounds like uh, they've taken a page out of Donald Trump's book of delay, delay, delay. And unfortunately, we live in a world for the last decade where we've we've sort of gotten trained to to see that as a tactic, you know. Um, and it's a very it's a very machismo male type of tactic. And and maybe maybe that's an influence on it. I don't know. I'm just grasping at straws there. I don't think you're wrong. Oh, okay. Great. All right. Well, we're going to come back to that in a moment. Let's take a short break. You're listening to Divorcing Your Mortgage, uh, and we'll be right back after this. And welcome back to Divorcing Your Mortgage. Uh, so Sam, uh, just before the break, we, we we started talking about role models and we were both in agreement that that perhaps the, um, uh, the machinations and the machinations of Donald Trump over the last decade are something that is uh, influencing men in particular to take litigated uh, positions in regard to divorcing their wives, especially with regard to uh, older couples. Um, thoughts? I think that without being too political, I think that the landscape has changed in court, in society, in culture, in environment, everything. Mm -hmm. And so I think people are seeing things differently and seeing certain people as role models. And then they're also seeing their friends, by the way. So they're being mm. influenced by their peers and their uh -huh. you know, friend groups and starting to see that maybe this is the way of doing things when it's completely not the way to do things. I think you need to speak to an attorney and see to, every case is different. So if your attorney is telling you this is the way to go, this is in your best interest, I think you trust your attorney's judgment. Let's talk about that for a second. Is, is an attorney's office really the, the, the right place to get this kind of advice? Would would um, we're talking about men in particular right now? Might it be better if a, if a man sat sat down with a with a, a therapist or a marriage therapist and kind of talked it out a little bit uh, in addition to talking to his attorney? I love that you said that. So our office is different in that when we do our consultations, which we do free consultations, which not a lot of attorneys do, but we mm -hmm. offer a fifteen or twenty minute consultation and. During that free consultation, one of the first things my office says is that, have you seen a therapist? Are you interested in seeing a therapist? And we think that, you know, most times we tell them before filing for something like divorce, which is life changing, mm -hmm. how about you go and seek therapy? And then if you still feel adamant about this, then come back to us. And most attorneys don't do that. But I think you are absolutely correct in saying that they need to seek therapy and make sure that they are 110% sure before they go filing divorce. It's been my experience that a lot of men, especially older men, especially men that are stereotypically male, chafe at 
the word therapist, all right? I'm wondering um, if a better response might be gotten if if the word coach was used or um, in, in, instead of therapist, uh, because in a certain age group, the, the, the concept of therapy implies that something's wrong. And, and I'm just wondering if, if some of that might make a difference. I don't agree. Okay. Uh, I think it's a cultural issue too. I think that that's right. the root of it. And I think that, for example, in an Arab culture, therapy is exactly what you said. There's something wrong with someone. So to find an Arab man in therapy, you're not going to. Um, to find a Hispanic man in therapy, very rare. I mm -hmm. think it's culturally specific. And I think that it's also, it has a lot to do with your upbringing, how your parents have taught you to think. Right. A mindset issue. And I am a millennial. And even millennials have issues going to therapy or even seeking therapy. And we're seeing this with our clients. We talk to them every day and they're still not willing, even when we say it in the free consultation, like, you know, before hiring us, go and talk to a therapist. And they're like, nope, my mind is set. I'm ready to go. Oh, it's interesting. I, I had a friend many years ago in the automobile business and, and, he was a, and he was a new car salesman. And he used to say to me that if somebody came into the showroom who, who was within three years of a divorce... They always knew they had a sale because <laughs> they knew that either he or she was going to make an emotional decision yeah. about about what they wanted. Uh, and that always sh stuck with me because it it indicated to my way of thinking that they weren't fully in control and that they were making decisions uh, at a time when they sh maybe shouldn't be. Segwaying, uh, do you, you we've talked about the markets that you're in. Are you working with uh, same-sex couples as well in Absolutely. relation to divorce? Are you working Absolutely. in that in that market? Absolutely. Do do you find um, do do you find subtle differences in those type of divorces, or has the uh, the playing field changed since same-sex marriage became illegal? Is it now just the same you know, the same thing except that it's two men or two women? No, I think that every type of divorce has its own issues and things that we need to understand and be cautious towards. And I think that it takes a specific type of attorney to work on um, a same-sex divorce. I don't think every attorney is the right fit for every client. And that's what we pride ourselves in. We are supporters of the LGBTQ AI community. We have team members who are part of the community. And so I think that it's crucial that people in this community seek out attorneys who they feel comfortable with because the issues that they're that they have they want somebody to understand what they're going through and be mm -hmm. able to counsel them correctly can you can you off the top of your head can you give us any any things in particular maybe two or three things that you feel are unique about um those type of divorces that would require somebody with a certain sensitivity so i think that um when they have, uh, the majority have family issues. So they have, um, how do I say this baggage from their childhood? Yes. Um, some of them have not come out until very late in life. Um, some of them have been married and have kids from their previous relationships. So that complicates things even further. There's a lot of psychological um, mental health issues that come up with same-sex divorces that don't always come up and non-same-sex divorces. Got and so I think that those are those are huge. I also think that asset uh, equitable distribution is also huge because we usually see that both are professionals and it's a little bit more difficult to um, distribute assets. And then when there are children involved, that also uh, becomes a little bit more, more difficult as well. Gotcha. So Sam, if anybody listening uh, wants to get a hold of you and uh, and your team, what's the best way to get a hold of you? You can call our office at 305-677-5119. You can visit our website at www.flpfl.com, or you can visit me on social media at Lawyer Lady Boss. Lawyer Lady Boss. There you go. Thank you for listening to Divorcing Your Mortgage. I'm your host, Matthias Gertz. Our guest, Sam, has educated us completely on the divorce scene in Florida. Thank you for listening. Get home safe. Give your kids a kiss and we'll see you next week.